as they continue to enhance the delivery of knowledge to our children. It further seeks to create 100,000 job opportunities for the youth, besides implementing a subsidized farm input scheme for vulnerable households, and parts of the resource allocated will be utilized on the ongoing fabrication of 250,000 school desks crafted by local artisans. Mr. Speakers, despite the very difficult times that we have faced as a nation, our people have remained resilient. In the face of tremendous economic challenges and the health crisis we are facing, the majority of us have truly been our brother's keeper. Not only have we stood with our family members and friends going through hard times, we have also acted responsibly by following the laid down public health directive. But fellow Kenyans, we are yet to get out of the woods. And so I urge all Kenyans to keep doing that which is honorable and right. As a nation, we will overcome and thereafter soar to even greater heights. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the fore the urgent need for us to upscale our implementation of the universal health coverage pillar of our big four, which pillar seeks to eradicate the poverty of dignity and transition our nation into an era where no Kenyan should be forced to sell their land in order to settle their medical bills or be forced to make a choice between buying much needed medicine and using money to feed their children. An impossible choice. Last year, I informed Parliament that the national government in partnership with the county governments was piloting the universal health care program in the counties of Nyeri, Machakos, Kisumu, and Isiolo in preparation for a rollout nationwide. I am pleased today to report that the pilot program for universal health care was successfully implemented, and out of it, we have isolated critical learning points, enhancements to my administration's health policy priorities going forward. As we inch closer to the national rollout of the universal health coverage, I also a fortnight ago in Mombasa launched the biometric registration for the universal health coverage scheme. Similarly, my administration is instituting far-reaching reforms of NHIF as it perfects the medical insurance scheme. Honorable members of parliament, it is notable too that there has been a phenomenal increase in mental illness across the country and indeed around the world, which has caused serious national distress and anguish in our families. The government that cares, I have established an office in the Ministry of Health with the full responsibility of spearheading our national response to this latest disruption to our social order and our, nation, our nation's wellness. To institutionalize this initiative, I have issued an executive order establishing an ultra-modern national mental health hospital, and also elevated Madare National Teaching Referral Hospital as a semi-autonomous specialized hospital. And I shall be looking to this house to support in the funding of this facility. The East Africa's premier mental health facility will be established to offer training, research in psychiatry, 
specialized psychiatric services, forensic psychiatric services, child and adolescent mental services, and substance abuse related and addictive, disorder, uh, addictive disorders treatment and rehabilitation services. Challenges to our public health notwithstanding, I am confident that in partnership with the county governments, we are on course to realize the aspirations that we have of universal health coverage for all. Honorable members, a, a, a nation's future is its children. As custodians of and trustees for future generations, it is our duty to protect, nurture, and mold our young children into responsible citizens. Our children embody the only true guarantee of continuity of this project that we call Kenya. To this end, my administration continues to institute far-reaching reforms within our education sector. And in January last year, we successfully completed the rollout of the competency-based curriculum, an exercise which, while notwithstanding its challenges, is one that has nevertheless been fully embraced by all stakeholders in the education sector. As at the end of 2019 calendar, 2019 calendar year, we had been able to achieve a textbook to pupil ratio of one to one for grades one to three. I assure this distinguished sitting that the journey to replace the 844 system with a new fit for purpose curricula is well underway and refinements are being undertaken in the course of implementation. Honorable members, as a parent and also as a grandparent, I share in the pain and frustration of most parents in having our children home for nearly an entire year. However, as a responsible government, we put the health and safety of the children as the paramount consideration. The gradual and phased reopening of schools that began with the examination classes is being carefully monitored at all levels so as to ensure that our young Kenyans are safe and secure as they continue preparing for their national examinations. The Ministry of Education will, within 14 days of the date hereof, announce the 2021 academic calendar with all other classes expected to resume learning in January of 2021. Still on the subject of our basic education, I made a commitment to the nation during my last State of the Nation address that no child should be left behind, meaning that no child be denied their right to access education. I am pleased to report to this House that for the second year we have been able to achieve a transition rate of 100% from primary to secondary schools. And even as we prepare to reopen schools, I once again reiterate that no child will be left behind, even those who unfortunately have transitioned into being young parents. Honorable Speaker, we must say that in the face of these undoubtedly impressive gains, we must guard against resting on our laurels. The next frontier in the quest to providing education for all is to improve our education in Kenya by enhancing quality of education 
both in terms of physical structure as well as content. It is evident that our public day and boarding secondary school infrastructure is overstretched. As a result, our students are suffering congestion in both classes and dormitories. These challenges, however real, must not stop us from pursuing what we know to be the right thing for our children. Rather, they should act as motivation for us to work even harder. Through a combination of interventions, both policy and financial, financial involving the Ministry of Education, county governments, and members of the National Assembly, through the National Government Constituency Development Fund, we shall have the necessary resources to address the infrastructure gap to our education sector conclusively within the next 24 months. In this regard, I therefore appeal to members of the National Assembly that the use of funds under your oversight should be used primarily to respond to the immediate and short-term needs of our learners. Currently, there is an urgent need for construction and equipping of more dormitories, classes, and other amenities to, fa to, to further facilitate ease of learning for our children. Indeed, conscience of the fact that significant financial resources will be deployed towards the construction of at least 12,500 new classrooms and related school facilities. And in that regard, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Transport, Infrastructure, Housing and Urban Development have been instructed that by the 1st of December 2020 to issue a new set of building guidelines for school infrastructure that allows the use of appropriate and cost-effective building technologies suited to the varied, the varied geographies of our nation. The intervention of these guidelines will achieve transparent and standardized bills of quantity that will guarantee value for taxpayer money. For every shilling that we put into school infrastructure, we must seek to obtain more classes built to acceptable standards. Fellow Kenyans, honorable members, Mr. Speakers, on the state of our economic development at Article 132, read with Article 10 of our Constitution, I am required to report to Parliament on a wide array of economic, social, and relational achievements. I call the sum total of these achievements our economic development. Honorable members, economic development is not about intentions and activities. It is about results. It is not about the volume of what we did. It is the, about the impact of what we achieved. In other words, economic development is the measure of the tangible, positive transformation of the well-being and the quality of life of our people. During this year's reporting, I will focus on four areas of primary thrust and situate the four areas within the broad framework of the Big Four. And I must mention at the onset that the Big Four is not a project, as many of think of it. The Big Four is an economic development strategy or framework which I have used to organize government delivery and to answer the question why, in terms of the selection of the priority areas that we are working on. The philosophy of the Big Four is anchored in four intentions 
which we have pursued relentlessly this year, despite the problem of COVID-19. The first one is liberating our urban poor from the poverty of dignity caused by poor housing and inadequate services. The second is transitioning our young people from being earners of wages to owners of capital. And the third is building a holistic base of human capital that is food secure and health assured. And the fourth is job starting the shift from being a country of net consumption to one of production. And this has been our why for the big four during this difficult year. Let me begin by report, my report to you by discussing the poverty of dignity visited upon our urban poor. Indeed, it is a shame that almost 60 years after independence, a majority of our urban dwellers live in a dignity-poor environment. Their sanitary conditions are inhumane, their habitations are deplorable, and our intention is to reverse this. And the Nairobi Metropolitan Service is a pilot project that has been successful in rolling back the frontiers of this urban indignity. The other intervention we have engaged in is that of affordable housing under the Big Four. And my administration's pilot project at Park Road, Nairobi, is the first beacon on this journey that was delivered ahead of schedule and within budget. We have also concluded the successful incorporation and capitalization of the Kenya Mortgage Refi Refinance Corporation. This corporation will improve mortgage affordability, increase the number of qualifying borrowers, and result in the expansion of the primary mortgage market and home ownership in Kenya, while also deepening the capital markets through large-scale, medium to long-time refinance options. I would also like to report that there are also ongoing reforms in the land sector to improve access to land as a factor of development. Towards further promoting and sustaining Kenya's national development, the National Land Titling Program continues apace. During my administration and over the last seven years, 4.5 million new titles have been issued since 2013, as compared to 6 million titles issued from 1963 to the year 2013. These are not mere abstract statistics, honorable members. They represent very real gains from Wananchi and the resolution also of long-standing historical land injustices. For example, just last week in Samburu, in, uh, in Samburu County, only 2,000 group ranches were titled by the preceding administrations. But up to early this month, my government has issued over 10,000 new titles in Samburu County, and by January of next year, we are on course to have issued a further 15,000 title deeds. Honorable members, just over a month ago, I also issued a further 2,000 titles here in Embakasi Ranching in Nairobi, whose combined value to the owners is approximately 6 billion Kenya shillings in the hands of our people today. 
So honorable members, to restore fully the sanctity of title, we are also digitizing all the land records across the Republic. This national endeavor is anchored under the National Land Management Land Information Management System, and the system is designed to enhance security of land re records, improve accessibility, and also dramatically reduce the cost of land transactions. I call on all stakeholders, and in particular the Law Society of Kenya, to embrace and support this positive transformation that removes that removes land information management in Kenya from its current 19th century system and standards to those that are more appropriate to the 21st century. Other reforms in this sector include the, formula the, the, the formulation of the sectional uh, properties bill to bring legal clarity to the ownership of sectional properties. The bill is in its final stages before, being in, before introduction to this esteemed house. My prayer to you, honorable members, is that we may pass this bill that will allow millions of Kenyans access mortgage, uh, mortgage and credit for their apartments and smaller dwellings and to create greater equity for all our people. Honorable members, let me underscore that eradicating the poverty of dignity is not just about securing tenure and dignified habitations. The poverty of youth dignity is also one of the areas that we have focused on. Youth pessimism and fatalism can also be turned to patriotism. If youth are liberated from the poverty of dignity, we have worked hard to give youth self-esteem and a sense of purpose. And we have done this because dignity comes from self-reliance and a sense of contributing to society. If the youth are given a sense of national importance, they will own the country and guard it jealously as active shareholders. Initiatives such as contracting youth artisans as suppliers to the big four projects is a visible example of this approach. The second intention under the big four during this report period has been about young people. My government's objective has been to shift our young people from being earners of wage to owners of capital. We have modeled this through engaging them in collective action. As we seek to grow our industries and create jobs in the manufacturing sector, we must have, we must of necessity, have the manpower with requisite skills to match the needs of industry. Majority of the skills required are with respect to blue collar jobs. <laughs> to blue collar jobs that need young men and women who understand the basics of the digital economy and who have the capacity to deploy both knowledge and ingenuity as they seek to solve a practical problem. It has taken considerable effort on the part of my administration to educate both parents and young people that there is a viable education pathway for Form 4 leavers who do not achieve the necessary grades to pursue university programs. This pathway is anchored in the technical and vocational training program. Today I'm proud to report that we have so far enrolled 430,598 students in 182 technical and vocational training colleges across the country. The curricula for these institutions has been developed in partnership with industry stakeholders in varied sectors of our economy 
ranging from the automotive industry, oil and gas, maritime and shipping, to agro-processing. We are also collaborating closely with technology partners to develop curricula for basic digital skills to allow our young people to take advantage of opportunities within the digital economy. Indeed, barely a month ago, I launched a border border scheme meant to bring together 1.4 million riders in that sector who actively support 5.2 million families across the country. What I told them was that in aggregate, these riders make a total of Kenya shillings 357 billion every year, which is more than the total disbursements that we make to 47 counties through the National Exchequer, which presently stands at Kenya shillings 316 billion annually. And what I told them with these statistics in mind it is clear that border border riders can come together and become owners of capital and holders of major investments. We are encouraging them to engage in saving schemes and to work together in order to create a capital base that will enable them to own petrol stations, border border assembly factories, and other investments that can transform their lives. Shifting our youth to become owners of capital also requires us to develop productive capabilities that move from the rudimentary to the complex operations. This is partly why we have revived Rivertex as a producer of textiles and a consumer of locally produced cotton. This is in line with the agricultural transformation strategy that obliges the growth of new strains of biotechnical, bio technical cotton as a key area of opportunity for Kenyan farmers. The manufacturing pillar of the Big Four also aims to provide training ground for our young people to acquire skills and to replicate them, these in light industries. The third intention under the Big Four during this reporting period has been to develop a holistic human capital base. Our intention here has been to expand our health infrastructure and to guarantee that the individual is free from want and free from fear. Similarly, and in support of the holistic individual, I would like to report that measures aimed at achieving food security are already in place. The implementation, for example, of the agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy is well underway. And we have also successfully reformed the agricultural import subsidy program. If we can achieve this intention of developing a holistic human capital base, then we will increase our national productivity and enhance our economic development. The fourth intention of the Big Four under this year's economic development program agenda is the commencement of the journey from being a country of net consumers to a country of net producers. And in order to make this shift, we must admit that we cannot experience any significant progress in manufacturing and agro-processing without the building of transport systems and making significant investments in energy. Honorable members, even as we mooted the big four intention, some of us recognized then, as we still recognize now, that the task of ending the indignity of not having decent shelter, the task of enhancing access to universal health coverage, the task, the task of enabling all who are willing to live in dignity through sweat of their brow to thrive, and the task of ensuring food and nutrition security would not be completed in a single term of office. That being the case, we gave a solemn promise that by the end of 2022, 
we would have laid an unshakable foundation for the realization of this vision, which is a shared aspiration for millions of our Kenyans. As an enabler to the Big Four agenda, my government will continue to roll out seminal programs in response to the needs of businesses, both large and small. We are continuously enhancing the ease of doing business and creating an enabling environment for all our enterprises to thrive. Earlier this week, I commissioned a transit shed at the Kenya Railways, Nairobi, and dedicated it as a clearing point for cargo imported into the country by our small traders, saving them the agony and inconvenience of delayed clearing of their trade wares, as well as saving them considerable financial cost. The dividends of our sustained reforms and investments over the last few years continue to enhance our nation's competitiveness and ranking globally. We have recorded many milestones thus far, such as Kenya's 80 slot improvement since 2014, with our nation currently ranked at number 56 globally, globally and ranked third in Sub-Saharan Africa on the Ease of Doing Business Global Ranking Report. This from a low of 136 position globally in 2014. As an affirmation of our place of pride within the community of nations, Kenya now ranks number one globally in protecting minority investors and fourth globally in terms of getting credit. The number of companies registered daily has increased by 500% from 30 in 2014 to 200 in 2020 and a daily average of 300 during the COVID-19 period. On aggregate, 400,000 companies are annually now registered in Kenya. My government, eh, what do you want to do with Ata nyinyi. My government has heeded the cries for bold and decisive actions to reduce the unnecessary regulatory burden occasioned by the multiplicity of licenses at both the national and county levels. Our initial focus in Nairobi City County has seen the waiver of a single business permit to all new businesses registered in Nairobi for the first two years of their operations, effective March of this year. We have also waived the presumptive tax requirement for all new businesses. These two initiatives and others within our ease of doing program will now be aggressively rolled out nationwide as we endeavor to make it easier for both local and international investors to set up, operate and expand their businesses. And our endeavor is to make Kenya the best country on the continent in doing business by the year 2022. And for this, I seek the support, not just of this house, but also of our 47 county governments. As we continue to create an enabling environment for our enterprises to thrive, we are also enhancing connectivity in the country through ports, road and rail. In respect to key national trunk roads, the construction of the Nairobi Expressway project continues apace. And just last month, I witnessed the signing of Africa's largest public-private partnership funded project, the Nairobi Mao Summit Expressway. These are milestones which will have significant impact on the economy by decongesting Nairobi's gateways on the part 